Okay, so let's finish this up. And wait for the Super Bowl in the snow. All right, so on Tuesday, we talked about the first of the dual functions in the commitment trust theory. We talked about channel commitment. And now we'll talk about how do we go about and build channel, channel trusts, all right? So one of the things first to get an understanding of is that trust is one of those things that is very difficult to define, uh, to come up with a, a, a concept or a way of, of understanding it. Um, trust basically conceptualized is that the other party is honest and that the other party is benevolent. And so to trust a channel member, if you're looking for a definition, is to believe in the integrity and the concern for a mutual well-being. Um, in other words, that individual has some level of need or helping you, and that, that partner is treating you in a benevolent way. And that is extremely important because relationships require commitment, commitments require trust and trust comes from that benevolence. That, that individual, that other party is generally instant, interested in the other one's welfare and well-being. And it is those things that are extremely important. So how do we go about building trust? Well, there's a couple of strategies for doing this. And they basically boil down to the need for economic satisfaction and the need for non-economic satisfaction. So the definition we're going to use in here about economic satisfaction is a positive, affective, response to the economic rewards generated. Now, it's important to understand, and this is the interesting thing about it, is that affective is an emotional response. It is not a utilitarian response at all. It is an emotional feeling. Now, the you know, financial rewards are typically desired, but time, financial rewards are very difficult to measure. And so it is an emotive feeling, a satisfaction that you are receiving just benefits. And how do you find this economic satisfaction? You find this, this effective state when one corporation is willing to make investments in you. Risky, generic investments. We talked about this on Tuesday. And the same things build commitment and they build trust. These risky, generic investments create a vulnerability for your channel partner because you can take that and use that invested asset in the service of your competitors if you wish to or excuse me, the manufacturer's competitors. So I said before, the benevolence of steel tools, their willingness to pay for part of your own renovations, even though those renovations may not necessarily go to steel alone. And so you build these things, you create a more effective economic satisfaction and that economic satisfaction increases trust and it increases the relationship as well. Just remember, you can't compare money directly. And so when I'm talking about an economic satisfaction, it's a feeling like I'm doing okay. Not only okay, I'm doing really good. Now, this slide is wrong. We should say two drivers of non-economic satisfaction. I, I haven't changed it. It's been wrong. And I just um, 
never get around to it, all right? So the next is non-economic measures. These are interpersonal ways in which we act towards each other that have nothing to do with economic matters, but it just shows a willingness to get along with someone. And so what are the drivers of non-economic satisfaction? The first is dysfunctional conflict. And dysfunctional conflict is when there are deep unresolved issues in a relationship, when there is an absence of those dysfunctional, or excuse me, those questions that are not resolved, unresolved issues, if there's an absence of that, that is a driver for non-economic satisfaction. The absence of coercion on the other side means that there is a lack of punishment or pressure that you can resolve conflicts without being obtrusive. The willingness to even go so far as to share vital information that would be considered important to their success without, of course, affecting legal barriers. Now, along with these non-economic factors, there also includes the perception of fairness. And if you look over here on the side, I have two definitions of unfairness, and I'm gonna talk about unfairness again, but I like them to be brought up to the beginning. You'll see unfairness talked about also in terms of justice, it depends on who writes the articles. But what we're talking about is procedural fairness or procedural justice and distributive fairness or distributive justice, they're the same thing. Depends on what psychology research you get out of. I don't know why they did it like that. You know, some reviewer on a bad day said, yeah, you can keep fairness. So anyway, what is procedural fairness? Procedural fairness is feel like being treated equitably in your day-to-day -day interactions. And so in other words, you're interacting with your particular partnership and you feel like they're treating you fairly. And that the rewards of that relationship are equal to the rewards of the relationship with other partners that they may have. I might be a small partner with Walmart, but Walmart still considers me important. And so it is the fairness in day-to-day -day interactions. When we get to role models, when do, are the actors in the role, are they being fair? And are they treating me as someone of value? Distributive fairness is the feeling of being treated equitably in the distribution of rewards. And so when it comes to the handing out of money or whatever the non-economic benefits can be, recognition is one. Maybe another changing you to net 45 instead of net 30, that would be an example. That the rewards, that the rewards are equal. Or let's just say you're being treated fairly. That's perhaps the better word because equality can be a very slippery term. And so the perception of fairness is extremely important. And that is a non-economic factor. Now, um, one of the things 
that is difficult in any decision-making process in any organization is to ask yourself where are the decisions made in an organization, in an organization excuse me, upper level organizations or centralization of orders hurt trust. When the upper echelons make decisions, it undermines cooperation. And all of the daily interactions that promote trust well, I got to talk to the man upstairs. Is a classic example. Now, let me also say this, the rules are extremely important because they create boundaries for your customers, but you need some type of decentralization in order to be able to really expand trust. So to give an example of a decentralized situation, I have friends of mine who worked at Walmart and, and 20 years ago, a friend of mine who was a house painter and he was great, um, he had liver issues and he needed treatment and his wife worked at Walmart. Walmart transferred her to Florida, let her work there and he could go there for treatment. And then when she came back, she got the exact same position that she had when she had left. In other words, they allowed the manager to keep that position open. That's an example of a decentralization decision that promotes fairness and increases trust. Now, formalization is good, it, it, it maintains a field so that the actors know their place. And so it can be good, but it's important that it isn't contractual because contractual can increase difficulties. If the rules help clarify who performs what, then it's great. And it's not actually a saving grace <clears throat> Because one of the difficulties is, is that when an employee does not have a clearly spelled out procedure, we know that they will act in a relativist way, which may be contra to both organizations. And so it's important to have formalization. It's important to have rules, but you want them to have those rules without the contracts because rules can be bent. And so that's one of the ways that formalization helps is it helps to clarify who performs what. So I said this over there about, let's see, did, oops, did I go one? Okay, no, I went, okay. All you can do in a management situation is try to create a situation in which both sides are conductive to building hope and trust. It's slow, it's expensive, it's uncertain, it doesn't always work, but it's the only one that lasts and it's why you have to do it. And not only that, but it promotes hopefully goal congruence. In other words, when both organizations can work together. So one of the things that when a big organization and a really small organization form a channel system, one of the difficulties is, is that the big organization has naturally enormous power. Not only that, but the big organization has to be able to trust that smaller organization. Well, the way you do it is you find out if that organization's goals are consistent with yours. And if they are, if you remember the, the Morgan and Hunt um, commitment trust theory, shared values is probably, prob spit it out, positively related to both truth, commitment and trust. 
this is the slide I was looking for next. You can bet this will be a test question. All right. Relationships are very damaged by unresolved perceptions of unfairness. I would even say that the perception of fairness is the worst thing to a successful relationship. It is, as Palminger calls it, it's relationship acid. It not only undermines your trust, it aggravates the negative effects of dysfunctional conflict. It makes your partners act in an opportunistic fashion. And so of all of the factors that erode trust, it is a perception of being unfair. So, how do you prevent unfairness? There's four baselines that you can tell whether or not, um, and, and one of them has to do with how much are you willing to give? And not only that, but are those investments unique and special? And that's what's called an idiosyncratic investment, an investment that isn't easily used in some other way. And so the first thing you do is you look at your, their own inputs, how much you're doing. You look at the benefits derived by comparable dealers. And so if I am, a uh, modern Ford uh, dealership here, one of the things I want to know is what are the benefit packages that the Ford dealership in Wilkesboro is getting? That would be a good measuring stick. The next is I would want to know the benefits from the next alternative and other suppliers know how well they're doing. And then finally, how much is the other party member? How much are they putting in? If you invest little, you gain little. And so in order for rewards to be high, you need to be willing to invest big. Okay, so we've talked around commitment and trust. And so what we're going to talk about now is what's called the channel relationship life cycle. And so um, in the 60s and the 70s, they did this and they've done some studies on it and it is relatively consistent. Um, it is kind of a very useful tool for being able to go through an acceptable relationship in, in, uh, in channels. And without further ado, let me just go ahead and say it's gonna get very Dr. Philly here for a minute, okay? So I'm gonna throw this very busy slide at you and we're gonna use this slide as a way of talking about it, all right? So what Palmentier states, and others have as well, is that there are five relationship phases in marketing channels. So the first is what's called awareness. And this is where the organizations know each other. You happen to know individuals within the organization. Um, you may be in close proximity. Um, you don't have very much interaction. When, when I was a computer store manager in Lafayette, Louisiana, there were like three other computer stores. There was Intercom, uh, there was Entree, and I think there was another independent dealer. Anyway, um, so we all knew who we each other were. We, you know, uh, I knew who the managers were. Sometimes if I felt like, and I had a good relationship with the one at Entree, 
he had actually left where I was and he was there. And so if I had a question I couldn't ask or answer, he could help me sometimes. If I needed a bolt of paper, he'd give it to me for an outrageous price and I'd pass the price on and say, hey, sorry, that's what Hunter is doing. Um, so anyway, that's where the awareness stage is. You know where each other is. You may have done a few transactions together, but you're not really there, all right? The next is exploration, where you actually start to test the relationship. And so you start probing on both sides and you start investigating each other's motives and you start to see kind of norm behavior. So there's a outstanding book called I'm Okay, You're Okay. It was written in the 70s and it's still great. It's called Transactional Analysis. And one of the wonderful things that it talked about is how about the roles that individuals play. And when you start to get into a relationship, people start playing roles. And so when you talk to one of the individuals in those organizations, you take on the role as either a purchaser or someone who is helping another out. Um, you find also that interdependence between each other starts to grow. This is also the part where the bargaining starts to happen. And if you haven't bargained now, and this was my sister's big problem, you need to bargain at the beginning of any relationship and not at the end. You can't jump in with both feet. So such things as, is it COD cashier's check? Can it be net 30? I mean, how much is the expectation? Those kind of things. And you slowly kind of selectively reveal each other a little bit. There's a lot of sensitivity about who's got more power and those kind of things. And, and so that's where that phase starts. And any minor thing can turn that away. The next is an expansion. And this is when the relationship grows rapidly, all right? You start to see risk taking happen. There's a greater satisfaction between each other. There's a greater cooperation and communication, and the goals start lining up together. You, you think of success as being something that can work together. And then also, alternative partners start looking less attractive. You start to have loyalty to those individuals. Um, and the key feature of also is that the momentum has to be maintained. And so each party seeks new areas of activity and you try to make these efforts grow together, all right? And so it's all kind of building in a rapid state. So phase four and the commitment is where each party invests to build and maintain the relationship. The relationship is built around more station keeping, for the lack of a better word, where you're hoping to keep the relationship going. You tend to not think about what you're going to do together. In the next, sounds like a relationship, doesn't it? You don't think about what you're going to do on Friday. You're starting to think about being with this organization in the long run. Um, you may have alternatives, but you're not courting them anymore. You start to have higher expectations for your partners as well. And there's a very high dependence and a high trust that comes together. You tend to have the partners resolve content, uh, conflicts together and you start to adapt to each other. You become more, you know, more like each other and the values that you share and the risk you share become much higher. And then you start to see things like loyalty. And if you think of the definition, the old marketing definition of loyalty, it's where you desire to continue a particular brand or product, even when there are even more viable alternatives, this is where commitment goes. Now, the last phase is a phase that doesn't necessarily have to get to, but this is the one that where things go wrong. And this is decline and dissolution. And this happens or it gets start when one side, when one side, it does not commit as much as another side does. It really sounds Dr. Philly, doesn't it? Dissatisfaction from one side leads to the other side holding back investment. Um, you might see reciprocity happening either way as well. Um, it may be abrupt, but it could be gradual. And, and of course, it takes two to build, but it only takes one to undermine. 
And it often sets in sometimes without the parties even realizing. And voila. And so this is the phases that you go through in marketing channels. Now, some of the things that you have to know and how do you care and feed a relationship. The first thing you have to realize is relationship development takes time. Particularly if the targeted partners don't do business together. And it's important also to understand that as I was trying to uh, imply is that the relationships are rarely linear. They're never, maybe never sequential either. You can go from an awareness stage to a commitment overnight, especially if certain things happen in the economy. And so you kind of ask yourself, is there a way of measuring how well the relationship is going to do? And so this is the concept of a relationship velocity. So, I might do a bonus question on this. So this is an article that's on As You Learn. And if you notice, it's written by Palmentier, a girl, a couple of people who wrote the book. And this is their JM article on relationship velocity. And so they measured 344 marketing channel relationships. And they did something that's very difficult they measured it in a longitudinal study. In other words, it's a period of a study over years. And so without getting into the weeds, I wanted to show you this. And this shows you the change in customer commitment over time. And it confirms, doesn't prove, it confirms the lack of linearity. In other words, it's not a straight line, no straight lines it tends to be wavy. And what it says is relationship velocity is the size and direction of commitment. Relationship velocity is the size and the direction of a commitment. And so, So there's the drawing, easier to see. So the first six years of 433 tested channel relationships shows the commitment velocity and how it works out. It shows that it's not linear at all. So the important thing to understand is that relationships require maintenance. Um, you suspect that one partner is taking advantage of another, um, you're failing to live up to your promises, you can have a downward spiral in a relationship. And so one of the other things that you can do to manage a, a troubled relationship is what are called mutual idiosyncratic investments. And let me use that word again. So an idiosyncratic investment is a unique specialized investment that can't be readily used in some other location. You're in essence throwing money into a deep hole. But those are extremely important for being able to manage relationships like that. So how do you do it? I mean, if relationships are forever going under, what is the key to success for relationships? Well, the key is, is that to be successful, you need to have more than one relationship. And so if I'm a manufacturer and I'm looking for um, fixed goods, or excuse me, sub-assemblies or raw materials or those kind of things, I'll have a portfolio of downstream relationships and each one of those relationships is going to be in one of those five phases. One of those groups may be in awareness, one may be in commitment, one may be in expansion, but what you have is with this portfolio is that you can have more than one partner 
to be able to have a commitment. It only works in channels, not real life. All right. So success with relationships is having more than one partner because it means that if one of the partnerships dissolves, it means that you still have that connection. All right. So the last thing to say in this statement on relationships is that relationship quality is a combination of the commitment and the trust and the satisfaction. And if you have the increased presence of those variables, then the relationship is on a strong footing. And you know it, because as I've said before, people are poor actors. You, you know, they think that they're hiding, but they're not. So the last thing in this chapter is a discussion of the multi-channel versus the omni-channel. And this is probably gonna be an essay question. So what are, or how does relationships pertain in the differences between the multi-channel versus the omni-channel? Realize that for a seamless integration requires that the parties commit at a much deeper level. And we've talked about this. And it may recruit, include very relationship specific investments. One of the things that Amazon has done that eBay did not was they single sourced their shipping. Amazon, Amazon has spent enormous amounts of money putting up their marketplace so individuals can sell within the marketplace, but they require, they require a heightened state of conformity. In the omni-channel context, interdependence and commitment are far greater because you have to have a seamless integration in order to be successful. And because you serve different channels dirt through different segments, everything has to be the same. As a result, in the customer experience in the omni-channel, trust and commitment needs to be seamless. And so, if I were to get a neat, nifty little drawing here, this is how you can look at the omni-channel in comparison to the multi-channel when it comes to relationships. Omni-channel demands a seamless integration, a deep commitment, a higher amount of relation-specific investments or idiosyncratic and generic investments, and a maximum amount of interdependence. And the multi-channel, because it is just different traffic directions, it tends to be siloed, more perfunctory in commitment, and the relationship and the interdependence is variable. I'm gonna be really interested in this. I was just reading an article. Um, Amazon has put up a bid for Kohl's and Kohl's actually has two bids up right now. And Kohl's has rejected both of those and they're like $65 million. And I would think that Amazon would keep Kohl's name. I could see this possibly happening, but I can also see Amazon invested products in islands, such as the electronic section with Kindles and those kinds of things. That's possible. That's if they go. It's, I, I think it still sticks in Amazon's throat that um, Walmart's still making half a trillion dollars a year and they're piddling around at 110 million and they feel, no, no, 110 billion and they feel, you know, they feel hurt, okay? So anyway, we'll see what happens. I'll bring in the article next week. All right, and that is the end of Channel on Relationships. Um, next Tuesday, when we come in, we'll talk about conflict. Um, I'll go over the groups and send out your group in, uh, information. You'll have your first position paper starting. 
and it will be due in two weeks. And we will talk about all of those things on Tuesday. And I'll talk about how I want you to have them set, okay? All right, let's get out of here. Have a good weekend. You're welcome.